So you sold your company to Apple in 2010. Right. What was it like to do a deal with Steve Jobs? Relentless. <laughs> uh, actually, it started out with a phone call. He literally called me out of the blue and said, we love what you're doing. And uh, could you come over to my house tomorrow? I'd love to talk about it with you. Did you fall out of your chair? Or? <laughs> a little bit. Uh, it's not the normal startup routine to two weeks after you launch your first app on the App Store to have Steve Jobs call you and invite you over to his house. Um, but yeah, we were, we were flattered, but uh, you know, we were very interested to see what they wanted to so say. So you went? We went. You met with him? Yep. And what happened? So we had about like a three hour discussion in front of his fireplace. We were putting our feet up there and chatting about the future. So he, uh, he was convincing us that they were going to win the smartphone wars and that if we threw, we call it throwing in together, uh, that we could really build a new way to in interact with devices, especially the iPhone. Now at the time, a number of different companies were trying to buy Siri, correct? Um, yeah, we had offers previously, but we weren't really ready to sell. So it was, you know, when, when Steve calls and, you know, every technologist wants to take their, what they're working on, their baby, and go big with it. So that was a pretty hard uh, thing to refuse. But we did decide, you know, it was a long process. So, um, you know, and he called me like 37 days in a row. Uh, he was calling me at midnight. And wow. yeah, so he was very involved and engaged in getting Siri to be a part of Apple. So that's what you mean when you say relentless? Yes. You did a deal with him and then you went on to develop with him. What was yes. that like? Yeah, he was very, very uh, active in this. So he, we met every week and went through, you know, how, what do we want Siri to do for, you know, for the first instantiation at Apple? Um, but he, you know, it was fun to work with somebody like him, that's so detail-oriented, that had a very strong opinion about what it should do, and we had a lot of good debates about it. But what was his vision, and how did it jive with your vision? Well, he wanted, the first thing he wanted to do that was different from what we were already doing was to make it really revolve around all the basic everyday use cases, you know, calling and messaging and reminders, and some of the things that we, you saw from the first version of Siri. Um, we also agree that eventually we wanted to get into a lot more things like conversational commerce, so the ability to buy, book, and reserve things, and you know, take things that were previously much harder to do with your phone, and because you can just use your voice to do it, make it much easier. There's a funny story about Steve saying to Siri, are you a man or a woman? What's your, what's your answer to the question of Siri's gender? So Siri's actually genderless. Even though uh, the, the name Siri in Norwegian means beautiful woman that leads you to victory, um, we, didn't, we decided deliberately not to make it one gender or another, and rather to have it be sort of a persona that's there to help you. So, and you're right, you can choose male voices as well right. as the default. Um, Siri was first integrated into the iPhone 4S. Now it's we're up to the iPhone XS. Has it lived up to your expectations? Well, so um, on the positive side, it's gotten a lot faster. The speech recognition got a lot better. Um, I would have liked to see Siri evolve to, do, to doing more things, so have greater capabilities to become a bigger part of your life, um, merely because it's doing so many more things for you. Uh, that was really the genesis for the idea for the next company that we started was how do we make it go from, you know, a not a novelty but a basic sort of utility in your life to something much bigger, a paradigm in itself that you know you're really relying on and use in your everyday world. So why do you think Siri hasn't gotten there? Is it Apple's fault? To some extent, but uh, I think they just had a different focus than than where we started it originally. Would you have liked? What would you have liked to see Apple do differently? Uh, I would like to have seen them open up to a third-party ecosystem much earlier. Um, that's something that we're doing now. Uh, we think that that's sort of the big missing piece, that if you look at something like the, uh, the App Store is a perfect metaphor for this. So the iPhone actually launched in 2007 with just a few Apple apps on it, you know, weather and some very basic things. But when the App Store opened and sort of unleashed the creativity of the developers around the world, that changed the world.
Now, you took the rare step of selling your next startup, Viv, to Samsung, and not a major U.S. tech company. Why? So one of the big focus for us in the Viv world was ubiquity. And when you look at the fact that Samsung sells 500 million devices a year of all different types, uh, we saw an opportunity to take our technology and really put it in a place where it could affect many millions of people around the world, lots of different contexts, different types of devices. Just the, mat the sheer scale that Samsung has is just an ideal platform. You just reintroduced Bixi, Samsung's AI voice assistant, yeah. to Samsung's developers. Yeah. What makes you think that Bixby can compete with Apple and Amazon and Google at this point? Well, so one of the points I made uh, at the talk yesterday was that people don't remember this, but Google was actually the 14th search engine to enter the market. So. Is there, I think we're still in a chapter one, or not barely even reading the introduction to this story. So I don't believe that there's a timing issue here. What we want to do is really gain momentum and get the, the world of developers in sort of an app store-like way, but bring that to AI. And when you have a thousand things that you can do with an assistant, it becomes a much more important part of your day. So when it comes to assistants, do you think we'll end up relying on just one or two, as with Google, just one? And or do you see us using many assistants right. in the future? I think that ultimately it's going to boil down to a few, but I think you'll see minor uh, assistants and that will specialize in some things uh, be a part of that game. But I think ultimately because it requires it to become such an important part of your life, all the personalization, everything that it learns about you, your habits, your preferences, I think that ultimately people will use one far more than others. So I, I do think it becomes more like the search market. Do you see this being integrated into washing machines and refrigerators and what does that world look like? It's already happening. Mm -hmm. So uh, you'll actually see that sooner rather than later out of Samsung. Yeah. Uh, within a few years, uh, Bixby will be on a billion devices. And that's just in Samsung and then we're going to open it up to other third party uh, hardware as well. What do you say to the people who, who think these listening devices are creepy? And, you know, maybe they don't want it in their living room. They don't And they don't trust <laughs> Apple and Amazon and, and Google and Samsung not to listen to them when they don't want them to be listening. I would say don't buy them. But the actual, you know, the reality is uh, that, that all the companies that I've been associated with take the privacy and security aspect of this very seriously. So people have asked me, so is my Alexa listening to me or my HomePod or my Bixby, you know. The answer is no. It's listening for what's, what's called a wake word. And the wake word is, you know, the thing that l lets it know that you're ready to tell it something, to give it some sort of a command. But, you know, I, I'd say the bigger risk is, yes, there's some security concerns when your whole house is full of devices that could possibly listen in. There's security risk with hackers or somebody, you know, breaking in. but. It's not with the companies themselves. There's no sort of behind the scenes conspiracy to listen in to what everyone's doing. What about Facebook? They just came out with a, you know, a, a smart speaker and people are skeptical. Like Facebook's had a lot of privacy issues, intentional or not. Yeah, so um, I know Mark and that team pretty well and I, I'm not amongst those who believe that there's some you know, conspiracy to grab a bunch of data or invade anybody's privacy by them uh, or anyone else. Do you think Apple can catch up in smart speakers? I mean, people think that Apple had Siri and that not, you know, beating Amazon to the punch with Alexa and Google Home, that they missed an opportunity. Yeah, I think, I think this market is wide open on all these products and the evolution that you're going to see with opening this up to third parties is going to transform everybody's business when it comes to this. What about monetization? Monetization of D AI and, and voice AIs is nascent. Yep. Do you see that happening? Is it advertising, e-commerce? It's going to be a combination of all those things. So if you look at it analogous to the App Store, there'll be a lot of different types of, you know, some companies make their money by getting subscriptions, so others by advertising. There's different modes for different types of things that you're talking to. Some have screens, some don't. So actually, it'll be a mishmash of things, but ultimately, it's going to be a giant market. So where is voice AI in five years? Uh, I think it's in 
So today, it's already in 50% or more of households in the United States after only five years being introduced, which is actually the fastest adopted technology ever. Uh, five years from now, the basic things that are sort of uh, things like the quality of speech recognition, when that goes from the, to sort of today's 90% to over 95%, we pass through this quality threshold where it becomes much more pervasive. It's going to be in all sorts of devices. It's going to work a lot better than it does today. It's going to do a lot more for you, which is why we're strong believers, and we're not alone, since every other tech, com tech company is spending billions of dollars on this already. We think it's going to be the primary way that you interact with many aspects of the Internet and services. All right. Doc, thank you so much for joining us.